Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Great, wonderful. All right, well, thank you so much for being here in what's a very busy part of the semester for a lot of you. This is the first in-person Writers Speak Mahindra uh, Humanities Center event that we've hosted in person for three years, so it feels like a, a, a great night. Um, and what better person to have uh, than Elif Batuman uh, speaking with Beth Blum today. Um, I want to start by thanking the whole Mahindra team, Susie Clark, Steve Beale, Mary McKinnon, um, and everybody else who helps make these events possible. And also to Claire Massoud, who founded this series years ago, um, giving us the opportunity to have wonderful writers like uh, Elif join us on campus. Um, speaking of wonderful writers, we have Ben Lerner coming here on December the 1st. Uh, same place, same time. Um, hopefully some of you can make that uh, event too. Okay, so I'm super thrilled to be introducing Elif Batuman. Um, I first came across Elif's work some 12 years ago when her first book, The Possessed, um, was published. As someone in their final year of a PhD on a Russian writer, uh, reading Elif's memoir about studying Russian literature at grad school was simultaneously inspiring, consoling, and often hilarious. In the years that followed, Elif taught in Turkey and wrote journalism for The New Yorker, where she's been a staff writer since 2010. In 2017, she published her first novel, The Idiot, the story of Celine, a freshman, trying to navigate the turbulent waters of her first year at Harvard. The novel was critically lauded and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Earlier this year, she published the highly anticipated sequel, Either Or, in which Celine returns for her sophomore year to grapple once again with the big questions. What can great writers tell us about how to live our lives? Might they be giving us terrible advice? What does it mean to be a writer? And what should be my concentration? Her wise friend Svetlana picks hist and lit. Uh, both novels are wonderful, and if you've not read them, you really must. Even Harvard faculty, to whom it offers an at times terrifying window into how students think and speak about us. In conversation with Elif is Beth Blum, the, Harvey, uh, the Harry K. Weston Associate Professor at the Humanities here at Harvard. Her brilliant book, The Self-Help Compulsion, Searching for Advice in Modern Literature, was published by Columbia University Press a couple of years ago. Beth has taught a range of incredible courses here at Harvard, but the most pertinent one for today is the Harvard Novel, a course which, as some of you lucky enough to have taken it, features Elif's novel, The Idiot, on the syllabus. Okay, so the format today is Elif's going to start us off with um, a reading from either or, and then uh, Beth and her will have a conversation. Um, and towards the end, we're going to have the opportunity for some audience questions. I ask you, please, um, raise your hands if you want to uh, ask a question, and then if you could wait for the microphone, uh, and that would be wonderful. Um, the microphone, Mary will be circulating the microphone through the audience. All right, uh, Elif, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you all for being here. I'm really, I'm really excited to be addressing you. Um, I will speak like this for the rest of the time. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start on page five, uh, which is quite near the beginning of the book. Um, all that really happened so far is she got to campus and checked her email. Svetlana got to campus the day after me, though it felt like years. I had already slept the night in my new room, eaten breakfast and lunch in the cafeteria, and made numerous trips back and forth to the storage facility, having the same conversation over and over. How was your summer? How was your summer? How was Hungary? I was dissatisfied by the vagueness of my own answers. I still hadn't figured out the right angle. How was Hungary? Lakshmi asked at lunch with a conspiratorial sparkle. Did anything happen? Notwithstanding my strong feeling that a lot of things had happened, I answered the question truthfully in the sense that I knew Lakshmi intended it. Nothing had happened. Svetlana asked me the same question that evening when we met at her warehouse-like suite in New Quincy 
and sat on beanbag chairs under an Edward Hopper poster and talked about everything that had happened since the last time we had spoken. When I had been in a phone booth in the Hungarian village and Svetlana had been at her grandmother's house in Belgrade, I told her how I had finally called Ivan in Budapest, how he had showed up with a canoe and we had sat up all night at his parents' house. Did anything happen? She asked in a lazier, more amused voice than Lakshmi's, but meaning the same thing. Well, like that one thing didn't happen, I said. Oh, Selin, Svetlana said. When Ivan first told me about the summer program in Hungary, he said I should take my time to think about it because he didn't want to force me into anything. Svetlana said that if I agreed to go, Ivan was going to try to have sex with me. This was a possibility I had never previously considered. I daydreamed about Ivan all the time, imagining different conversations we might have, how he might look at me, touch my hair, kiss me. But I never thought about having sex. What I knew about having sex did not correspond to anything I wanted or had felt. I had tried on multiple occasions to put in a tampon. Tampons were spoken of by older or more sophisticated girls as being somehow more liberated and feminine than maxi pads. I just put one in and forget about it. <laughs> I felt troubled by the implication that a person was constantly thinking about their maxi pad. <laughs> Nonetheless, every few months, I would give tampons another shot. It was always the same. No matter what direction I pushed the applicator, however methodically I tried all the different angles, the result was a blinding electric pain. I read and reread the instructions. Clearly, I was doing something wrong, but what? It was worrisome, especially since I was pretty sure that a guy, that Ivan, would be bigger than a tampon. But at that point, my brain stopped being able to entertain it. It became unthinkable. Svetlana said I had better think about it. You wouldn't want to end up in that situation and not have thought about it, she said reasonably. And yet, it turned out there wasn't much to think about. It was immediately obvious that if Ivan tried to have sex with me, I would let him. Maybe he would be able to tell me what I had been doing wrong. <laughs> Sorry, that's just so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he would be able to tell me what I had been doing wrong, and it wouldn't be as terrible as trying to put in a tampon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ella. Um, so when I hear you read that passage, and particularly the end, I realize I've spent probably most of my adult life having internalized the idea somehow, the really inane idea, that tampons are more feminist than maxi pads. Oh yeah, <laughs> and, interesting. Um, and it, it occurs to me that this, it's a really good example of the way that your humor works in general, I think, that passage, which is you, you take something, a kind of a social convention or expectation, and you defamiliarize it. Mm -hmm. um, often you kind of represent or re-describe something that is just a, a sort of a taken for granted part of adult culture. And, and you re-describe it in a way that's almost as if you're describing it to like an outsider, a very innocent outsider, like maybe a child or maybe somebody from a different culture mm -hmm. or something, <laughs> um, in a way that renders the convention kind of absurd. Um, like another example that I enjoy from either or is when Celine is, she, she doesn't really want to have children. And she's thinking about the different arguments people make for why you should have children. And one of them that I think the housekeeper of her grandmother suggests is, well, you should have a child because you'll have someone to take care of you. And she says, well, I would rather just pay a pre-existing person to take care of me <laughs> rather than just create a whole person just to have someone to take care of me. For free. For free, yes, which is. <laughs> Um, 
And, and so again there, you have this, the humor has both, it, it seems to have a sort of a therapeutic function for Celine. Um, it allows her to kind of cope with situations and to distance herself from stressful mm -hmm. situations often. But at the same time, it always has a kind of a sociological mm -hmm. point. It, it provides a kind of insight into conventions we take for granted and also hints that maybe these conventions could be different. Um, so I just, I really wanted to hear you speak about humor and the relation between humor and writing, which is in humor and kind of intellectual life. Um, it's a topic that Selena and Svetlana actually discuss during one of their many conversations where they're kind of debating, do you have to have humor to be intelligent or not? And Selena says yes. Um, but how do you think about humor and how do you use it in your life? Um, and, and what's your thinking about its role in your writing? Oh, thank you so much for that question. That's amazing. Um, now that I'm thinking about the two examples that you mentioned, the tampons and having children so that someone will take care of you, it occurs to me that both of those things were probably true at an earlier time than Sidon came into the picture. You know, probably when tampons were invented, I could imagine you could go swimming, you could wear a light yeah. color, like I, I could imagine that being, it gives liberating. you it's liberating or, and, and at worst it gives you one more option, right? So <laughs> yeah. like, even if you don't want to do it, but, yeah. but sort of like the pill, like the pill yeah. was so liberating and like, yeah. now is it? Well, no, now it's been co-opted into the whole sinister mm -hmm. set of oppressive structures. Um, yeah. So one thing I find really exciting about it, novels is, um, getting to ask how things could be different. And that mm -hmm. involves noticing how they are, which we often don't do. And you, um, yeah, and the, the other thing with having children so that they take care of you, I mean, that totally makes sense if you live in a community and that's the way that you give to the community is by creating more people and that everyone takes care of everyone. Mm -hmm. But in the world that Satan is born into, it just, it doesn't make sense. It does make, it's, it's unfair. You should pay someone. You shouldn't create someone to make them do it for like free. Never let it's, me go or something. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It yeah. starts to seem very, it has this sinister capitalist yeah. overlayer. Um, and I guess that is how I think about I mean, I don't know, not to nerd out, but we've been, we've been like talking about this stuff for a while, but I, I'm just thinking again about Don Quixote. Mm -hmm. I was just making fun of myself for constantly talking about Don Quixote, so now I'm doing it again, but that this basic, and, that, and, and Lukács' um, theory of the novel and his, uh, why Don Quixote is so important for him is that he's like, the novel is about a certain mode of being that seemed eternal, expiring and becoming ridiculous, like it, and which in the epic didn't happen, it just, which I don't, I don't even know if that's true, but, um, but that's what he says. Uh, and, and I do think that that's a really key move of the, of the novel is to take some idea that seemed like it was going to be eternal or that seemed that you couldn't question it and prove that it's actually historical and that mm -hmm. involves going around it in another perspective. Um, and in general, I think that that's, that's a, a classic move of human. Now I'm thinking about Bakhtin. It's just because I'm around, I'm not usually this insufferable. It's like, I'm, oh, I'm in Harvard. I have to start talking about Lukács and Bakhtin. But, but like it's, yeah. Um, yeah, about that, that like move to that take to look at. Yeah. Social estrangement. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and that parody is something that's like next to it. It's like looking at it from a different point of view. Yeah. Um, the other, well, I mean, thinking about the novelistic, I mean, the other project that the, the tampon passage is, I think of it in my mind, um, makes me think about um, is just the way that in either or you're trying to kind of redefine what counts as novelistic. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so basically in the first half of the book, we see Celine kind of nursing the wounds of this very ambiguous rejection from Yvonne. Um, but then as the book progresses, she, um, she has a kind of, well, sexual awakening, I guess, which is also a disillusionment in many ways. <laughs> Um, and she also has a kind of an aesthetic awakening. Um, and this is triggered in part by reading Breton's Nadja mm -hmm. and realizing that a lot of the experiences like, um, like you just read, um, that seemed like they couldn't be material for a serious novel. You know, it's not something Cervantes would write about mm -hmm. or, or Bakhtin would, would write criticism about, um, that this was a legitimate kind of area for novelists. And, um, so I wanted to ask, one, did you have a moment like that yourself? Um, and where you realized suddenly that all of this material that you had accumulated um, on your, your kind of Harvard experience could be part of a novel. And then, and then I wanted to ask you about how you see your own writing in terms of the larger trend 
the turn towards incorporating the personal and the subjective. And there's so much, there's so much kind of impatience right now among contemporary novelists um, with the contrivances of fiction and plot and character. Mm -hmm. Like, um, Knausgaard said at one point, I think, that the idea of having to invent a character made him want to vomit. <laughs> like just, um, and, you know, Hetty and others are similarly, although not in her latest, but kind of feeling, feeling like it's, it just seems so exhausting to have to try to make up a character and a story. Um, and, and so I wanted to hear your thoughts about that general feeling. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the question about what counts as material is actually built into the novel. I mean, I think Cervantes kind of is writing about that. He's mm -hmm. like, because one of the things that Don Quixote thinks is like, well, why don't the, I mean, that's kind of Sancho Panza, because he's like, um, you need to have clean linen. Like, why don't the tales of knight errantry talk about how you need clean linen and mm -hmm. how you need things to eat? And it's it's like, it's this constant discover. it's this constant clash between um, the, the descriptions that you get and that you kind of somehow in your head think that that is reality and then realizing that it's not. And, and also, meanwhile, the world is changing, so new things become mm. part of it. Um, and so those come into the story too. Um, I definitely relate to that uh, exasperation with having to invent fictional characters. Um, I, this is an experience that I, I gave sit in in the novel was the experience that I had in creative writing classes um, when I was younger, which was um, there was a lot of emphasis on creative writing as inventing, inventing characters, creating arcs, um, just um, imaginatively projecting outside of yourself. If you wrote about yourself, it was like self-indulgent or it was navel gazing. And it was, it was all about transcending yourself to get to some larger thing. And what I wanted writing for as a young person was to make sense of my own experience and the people around me. And I found the prospect of having to like on top of deal with my own life and thoughts and all of the exhausting, you know, input of different things that that I want to think about. And like on top of that, I have to deal with these like fictional people and <laughs> care about them and, and invent them. And it, I, I really did find it exhausting. Um, I I've talked to different. I think there's like two different kinds of writers, and there's there's definitely some people who I've met who are still out there who who actually are really annoyed by people like me, mm. um, and who are like, I feel censored by having to write about myself. I just feel like I don't want to. What I, the whole reason I want to write is so I get to be someone else and imagine different stuff and feel free. And like, why would I want to be confined into writing about this m one situation? But I feel the opposite. I feel like when I, if I'm not allowed to, if I feel that there's some reason that I'm not allowed to write about myself for some reason, I just feel like this is the only way that I'm actually processing like what's going on. I mean, it's like, why did Freud analyze himself before he analyzed other people is because you, you need to learn how that's the person you have access to. And that's like, that's where the high stakes come because we, we experience everything from, from our own point of view. So I, it, to me, it makes a lot of sense to um, write from that perspective. And I've been really happy about the, the auto fiction trend, even though I agree it's sort of an annoying word. Yeah. Um, thinking about <laughs> one of my favorite parts for some reason, um, of this book is when Celine is, um, I think she's reading a creative writing manual and she has to think of a favorite color and a favorite food for her yeah. character and she's like filled with despair. She's like, people have favorite colors? Yeah. <laughs> like, and then and she ends like up writing tacos yeah. beige. <laughs> But yeah, writing tacos beige on a piece of paper made it feel like the foreclosure of all possibilities <laughs> yes. of anything good happening yes. to me for the rest of my life. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have, I have a bit of a theory, uh, well, this occurred to me last night as I was preparing, about just thinking about this question of what, what are these kind of anti-novelistic um, kind of spheres of, of experience that you're making novelistic. Mm. Um, and one, one, one that came to mind to me last night um, that I think is actually in a weird way one of the more radical um, elements of, of this book is actually just how level-headed and kind of obedient Celine is, especially in the first half. Mm -hmm. Then she gets a little more risky and transgressive as things go on. But I was thinking, like, like you said, in, in Cervantes, we've seen kind of um, you know um, the material of everyday life represented before, and we've also seen 
we've seen feminist works by Doris Lessing and like Jean Rhys or you know people representing their sexualities as women and, and that experience um, or encounter. But we haven't, I don't think, or we haven't seen a lot of protagonists who are fundamentally, um, you know, good students. They get good grades. Um, Celine, she doesn't really drink that much. She doesn't really do drugs. Um, she's pretty level-headed. She has a lot of uh, common sense. And in, in a certain way, that, to me, is, as I'm reading it, it's what is most unusual and shocking in, mm -hmm. about it, in a way, is the idea that you could have a character who is not totally self-destructive, mm -hmm. um, but who's not banal. You mm -hmm. know, She's not a conformist. She's not conventional. But she's interesting without being uh, self-destructive. And I just find that really fascinating. I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I do have thoughts about that. I'm, I'm thinking now also Simone de Beauvoir mm -hmm. titled her memoir Notes of a Dutiful Daughter or something mm, yeah, like that. Yeah. I, like, I really identify yeah. as... I, I gave Céline this, this thought, too, that all the time that she's reading literature when she's in school, like with Huckleberry Finn and Catcher in the Rye, she's like, these people, like, yes. I know who this would have been in school, and, like, that person would have thought I was a total loser, and I would never have been able to run away from home and, like, not care about stuff, and so I'm never going to be an artist because you have to be a rebel. And I, I tried to get at that in this because I was thinking, now when I look back, sometimes I look at my earlier self and I'm like, you know, why was I so such a compliant subject? Like, why? And I, when I think about it, I just remember how much I identified with my mom and how upset my mom would have been mm. if I had done any of those things, if I had, and, and how she would have taken it as a reflection on her and her bad parenting. And I remember how she would tell me, I, I put this in the book also that, you know, my friend's daughter has an eating disorder and I don't know what I would do if you were like that. And I felt so sorry for her, like the idea of, and I, I couldn't understand other people who would, like kids my age who were not constantly worried about their parents and worried about ruining their lives mm -hmm. in every way. And I, in some level, I was conscious of that as sort of like cramping my own personal style. But then I was like, you know, but I didn't especially want to have an eating disorder. Like I, I'm going to put that use, <laughs> put that time to some other use. Um, but I, I, I did, I was really thinking about, I mean, one thing I was thinking about in this book in general is um, the role of childhood on adult life and, and the, the kind of just, like life is sort of a deal, like you get certain things and you do certain things and you get certain things and, and your understanding of what that is is sort of shaped by what your parents tell you at a very early age and everyone is kind of has a different understanding of what the rules are and nobody really talks about it, at least that was my experience. And everyone just, you know, you're 18 and you come to college and, and everyone has a different system in their head already from, it's like everyone was a prisoner in a different facility and they, they have different rules in mind and like everyone's just like, well, yeah, of course you don't do that. And, and just realizing that. Um, and for me, it wasn't really until, I mean, it wasn't really until I did years of therapy that I, learn to even think about it in those terms and to think about, because when you're, you grow up, you're just like, okay, this is reality. And it, it really takes a lot of work to look at it and think, work that's similar to the work that a novel does, to look at it and to think, okay, this is, a, this is, a, this is conditioned by this part of history. This could have been different. Here's some ways that it could be different. Here's where this idea that I have came from. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. You have and, to see the contingency of yeah, you have to see the contingency, and and for me, and I think, I think actually, I was thinking also of, I mean, now there's so much incredible writing by immigrants and by the children of immigrants, but when I was growing up, like this, I there wasn't that much that I was aware of, and I, I feel like compliance, like especially for girls and for people who come from another culture, and the like, the, the the burden to succeed is part mm -hmm. of what makes your life feel high stakes so like which is also a way of adding stakes to the book like otherwise who cares but like you know of course Celine thinks her life is important but like she thinks whether or not she becomes a writer is of life or death importance because her parents have gone into debt to send her to Harvard and like it and I, I really did grow up with all of those yeah. feelings and so I wasn't gonna go and you know drink until I passed out and and I saw people who were doing that and I was like okay that's like a person on a completely different journey that I'm not even really going to think about. And then there's the question of, oh, does that foreclose the artistic life for yes. me? And no, it doesn't. Just <laughs> drink as little as you want. Which is, yeah, I mean, well, that's because it's interesting, though, that you frame the relation with the mother as, as a form of worry or as a kind of burden not to um, upset her because 
I mean, when I'm reading this book with the eyes of a mother, I, I'm filled with longing. Like, I, I wish my daughter, who's only eight, would um, admire me and listen to me as much as you, oh, uh, well, as sorry. much as Celine <laughs> does, her mother. Um, but Mom, I hope you're listening. Yeah, she, sometimes she listens to these. But, but I feel like she's already <laughs> more skeptical. Than, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's uh, that the, the question of the dutiful daughter is really, I think, fascinating there. Yeah. Um, but perhaps that comes with a, a sort of a cost also. And I think that also- Well, I wouldn't, have felt, I wouldn't have felt so worried about her if I didn't admire her so much. You yeah. know, like the thought of upsetting her was like horrible because she's like, how would you rock the boat of this noble scientist mm. who's like, it's like her against the world. And then what I'm going to come in and be like, nah. <laughs> 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 I'm going driving with my drunk friends. <laughs> Um, it's, it's also, though, what you say, it makes me think about the fact that um, so much of contemporary self-help is actually premised on kind of undoing um, all of this, the way that we've all internalized the people-pleasing and the success and all that. And, and you're seeing, I think, a, a shift in the culture where it's about like how to peel away those layers of uh, expectation, which is kind of similar to what, in a way, is, mm -hmm. is happening in this book. But um, I want to... Maybe we can use the question of parents to segue into uh, the question of Harvard. Oh, yeah. Which is a site of <laughs> much parental agon and <laughs> influence. Um, and since we're at Harvard, and you've said two novels here, um, I want to talk about the role of the university. Um, and I want to read to you a quote by the novelist John Banville and ask you what you think about this. He said, all campus novels are, at a certain level, acts of revenge on institutions, on colleagues, on students, even on set texts. So my question for you is, um, is either or a revenge book? There's certainly an element of that in, you see these flashes with Celine where she thinks, I'm gonna bury all these people. <laughs> or like, <laughs> um, there's a kind of Stephen Dedalus like revenge seeking on the people who have, who have um, yeah, slighted you uh -huh. in the past, but um, Oh, that's funny. I didn't think of that line as that, but I can totally see how you would have thought that. Okay. Um, is every campus novel is that? I mean, I think that you could make a case that every novel is an act of revenge. I mean, if you, Don Quixote is, <laughs> is, is really set up like that. Like, you know, he's like, if I don't, you know, destroy, if I burn, don't destroy and burn down every last of the stupid novels of chivalry, then, you know, I won't rest happy in my grave. And he's really setting out like that. But, yeah. but, you know that if he really hated them that much, he wouldn't bother to write that whole book about it. It's, it's, um, and, and let alone think about trying to live life through that prism. And um, so, yeah, I guess I, I see, I see thinking of it as an act of revenge as kind of like a, a, not necessarily inaccurate, but sort of a glass half empty way of looking <laughs> at it. I would say that it's, um, I guess, so. A campus novel, it's like, it's about an institution that you go to when you're very young. You're obviously very vulnerable and it's an institution and you're going there so it can form you. And um, built into that idea is uh, A, that you're gonna be like shaped somewhat, like, you know, deformed in some way. Like you're not gonna come out the way that you went in and that the way that you went in was like not, not okay in some way. And, um, and when you finish and time passes and if you're a writer, and your job is to like think about and critique and process different modes of experience in the world, then you might, you know, think back at that time and be like, well, you know, how was I, how was I formed? How was I, sh and in, in, in some respects, it's like, I don't know if I think about myself, I'm like, in some ways I, I came out a lot better than when I went in. And then other ways, I think some of the stuff that I learned, like I would rather be the way that I was before that I, I mm. can't even get back to anymore. Mm. And I, I guess I think of it more as like redescription or maybe correction. Um, and, then it, and then it's sort of like, well, is, is correction actually a form of revenge? Like, you know, maybe it is because you feel when you do it, you know, you, I don't know. I always say that people who were, had super happy childhoods or who grew up feeling really well integrated with their surroundings would probably not become writers because if you were having these really integrated experiences, you wouldn't be like in your room alone, like, <laughs> you know, like trying to figure it out. Um, so if that, I mean, if that's what makes you a writer and that's what, um, or at least a certain kind of writer, then there, there, 
there is an aspect of it that's going back to experience and being like, this is the story that I was told about it, and this is, and this is how it looks to me now, and this is, and it's, it's telling your version of it, and it's, I think of it more as like adding something mm -hmm. extra than as like, and, and mm -hmm. doing it to like, to add to more information and to like, add to the just sum of knowledge rather than to hurt someone else. Mm -hmm. And actually that idea of revenge and writing being revenge, I think is something that um, Céline is really conscious of in either or mm -hmm. and kind of suffers. So it sort of goes into the compliant mm -hmm. thing. Um, she's constantly not writing because it feels like if she actually writes about Yvonne, it's like she's betraying him somehow or she's, um, if she writes about her mom, mm -hmm. she's like, you know, ratting her out. And that, um, and I think that's tied into the idea that we have about, I don't know, it's kind of tied into ideas of shame and how um, just to describe, I don't know, the idea that we have of how a person should be is so un, unrelated to what it actually is to have a body and be a person in the world. And it's kind of like any acknowledgement of that is, is seen as an accusation or you know something potentially like violent. Um, and what if that wasn't like that? You know, how great would that be? Yeah, that, that reminds me. There's kind of a chilling moment where she's um, with the custody therapist. Yeah. You know, and and um, she realizes she has. It's a revelation that something that seems like a neutral description, mm -hmm. when you imagine it being read by like your mother, your father, the person you're talking about, it can suddenly feel lethal. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, I I stayed with that passage for a bit because it felt like it had. It could relate to you know the act of writing about these people and drawing on these people. I've been thinking life. about that a lot. I've been because I don't know because I, I I worry I worry that people are going to think that I worry that people are going to think that I'm being vengeful. I, I worry that my mom thinks that mm -hmm. in some way and I yeah and I guess the way that I think about it I, it's because sometimes I've been written about so I try to think about like go into that experience and think about. It's it's not it's not delightful like it, it is very jarring to see yourself described by someone else especially mm -hmm. since like it's you know you are on your journey and they're seeing you and mm -hmm. uh, it can be it's unsettling yeah, yeah. it can be unset it can yeah. be unsettling I totally get it yeah. but like why does it have to challenge like I feel like there's a I feel like there's an initial pang that's like something completely unacceptable has happened and my very, my like whole understanding of myself has been radically called into question by some kind of like, you know, description that just mm -hmm. isn't even bad. It just doesn't match up with what I was thinking. And then I'm like, well, why, why do I think that? Like, I, I don't think I have to think that. I think I've been conditioned to think that. And it feels like another part of like the big, I don't know, the big, the big con that's keeping us all from, I don't know, like expressing ourselves and understanding the truth and being okay with, with just accepting reality and who we are and, mm -hmm. and growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, your, your use of the word corrective, I thought was really interesting. Uh, in, rather than revenge book, as mm -hmm. uh, thinking of either or as offering a kind of corrective. Because one of my favorite elements of this book is the, the sort of argument for um, curricular reform, which sounds really <laughs> boring, but um, the arguments for how the university could be reorganized that, that you offer here, and also how the teaching of literature um, could, be, could be altered in a way that might resonate more with students. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, in support of the idea that it's actually not a kind of negative, uh, purely negative critique of the university, I just want to cite this passage on page 13. Celine, she's so full of wonder and curiosity. She's just like the ideal student um, in a way. And, and she just says here, she's talking about living in, in, in the dorms, and she says, how brief and magical it was that we all lived so close to each other and went in and out of each other's rooms, and our most important job was to solve mysteries. The temporariness made it all the more important to do the right thing, to follow the right leads. And she treats her whole education as a kind of puzzle or mystery, and she's always looking for these clues and answers to how to live. Uh, but there is also an element of critique there. So she's very grateful towards her parents, towards the institution of Harvard. Um, but she's also, she has ideas about how things could be improved. And I, I wondered if you could just read the passage about the, the university disciplines there. Sure. I thought there was something wrong with the way the departments and majors were organized. 
why were the different branches of literature categorized by geography and language while sciences were categorized by the level of abstraction or by the size of the object of study? Why wasn't literature classified by word count? Why wasn't science classified by country? Why did religion have its own department instead of going into philosophy or anthropology? What made something a religion and not a philosophy? Why was the history of non-industrial people in anthropology and not in history? Why were the most important subjects addressed only indirectly? Why was there no department of love? <laughs> I just love that because all we talk about is how to restructure the humanities to make it like better, uh, better satisfy the needs and interests of students. And I, I even taught a whole graduate seminar on literary periodization. It was all about like why do we organize literary oh, studies? Oh, awesome! But, but so yeah, thinking about alternate ways That's that it so could cool. be. It's very timely, actually. It's like very. Um, very, very much speaking to debates that are happening in the discipline. Um, so one of the questions I had for you was, in retrospect, do you think it was a good thing that, um, that Cillin's university courses didn't supply her with the information and material too easily that she thought she wanted? There's, there's, there's a part where she makes fun of professors and she, mm -hmm. she talks about a blurb and she says, Oh, I recognize the professor's <laughs> characteristic delight at not imparting any useful information whatsoever. Um, and that's kind of how she thinks about academia. But not imparting information. Information. And not, not, it's not like, oh, she's like, what they're saying is not useful. It's just like, right. it's a withholding. <laughs> yes. it, yeah. But that is, I mean, yeah. there's, so, so she has to do that work of searching and looking and picking out mm -hmm. um, that kind of solving of the mystery. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, do you think that friction between what she wants from her education and her classes um, and what she's getting, do, is that a good thing or should that be kind of eliminated? Should these classes really cater more to what the students are dealing with right now and what they really think they need? Or is it good if they have to do a little bit more work to kind of fit things together in that way? Oh yeah, that's a bunch of questions, <laughs> all of them really interesting. Um, I mean, I do think that the curricular reform question, I mean, just in terms of decoloniality and, and the yeah. really belated um, addressing of, yeah, I think that's just so baked into the curriculum and it's, it's high time to, to look at that. Um, I do think that um, as a, now, now I teach college students mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I did the whole PhD with pedagogy training and, and I was a teaching assistant and then I adjuncted and now I, 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 I teach undergraduates. And I am increasingly struck by the extent to which the pedagogic norms that I learned and internalized, whether explicitly or implicitly, were based on frustrating the student. That if the student asks, you know, like, is this good or what's, what's important or like what's good or is this, that you have to say, well, what do you think? You, you can, um, it's and like it's, a therapist or something. Yeah, it's like a remember, therapist, like yeah. A psychoanalyst. Yeah, I think, psycho, I think it's really similar. Yeah. I think that psychoanalysis is also really built on frustrating the person. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it has to be like, I think it could be much more collegial. I think that these things are, there's like an idea of hierarchy. So I don't think you can actually iron out all, you know, frustration and, and friction from the educational process, but you can put yourself there with the person instead of creating some kind of hierarchy. So now I just try to think, you know, like the whole, like anything that is, is not, no, you know, no disrespect to Socrates, who I'm sure was great, but like I just, whenever it was like, this is Socratic, I was like, this person's going to be a massive pain in the ass and is like not going to answer anything. And like, um, so now I just, you know, if someone asks me like, what's good or bad, or, you know, I want to be like, well, it's up to you to th and, and I, I understand that it's like my job as an educator is like to try to get you to think about it. But I feel like the best way to do that isn't just to be like, what do you think right now? But just to be like, well, okay, here's how I think of it. Here's what I think is good and here's what I think is bad. Other people have the exact opposite view and here's why they think that. And like now we can talk, you know, you'll probably never know. You've got to choose one of them. They both have advantages and disadvantages, you know, like what do we do from here? And you can talk about it like a problem that you all have. Um, I don't know, I'm, I, I only teach in a small seminar and we just like discuss it and it, it, feels, it feels great. It feels therapeutic to me. Um, I, yeah, I hope they're not really separate. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, well, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned teaching because yeah. when, I, I, when I was reading this book again, I was really struck by, as I mentioned before, just all the explaining 
that is mm -hmm. happening in this book constantly, um, explaining of really difficult literature and philosophy, explaining of different aspects of growing up and coming of age, and that constant mediation. And I was actually thinking, teachers should really take notes about how to explain really difficult text in a way that is compelling and engaging and funny mm -hmm. um, for, for readers and, and other audiences. And I was wondering, I was wondering whether your writing for the New Yorker has um, has offered any kind of support. Is there any sort of fluidity between that that practice of writing uh, for a more kind of generalist audience, or kind of moving between specialist and generalist audiences, and all the explaining that you do in your novels? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think actually the person who taught me the most about how to explain stuff. I mean, the beginning was my mom because my mom is a, she's you know, a she's a hematologist yeah. and um, yeah, s specializing in multiple myeloma. And, mm -hmm. you know, and she had this belief that what I do, I can explain to anyone. And since I was five, she was just like, okay, here's the, like, she would just explain everything and you can, you can understand a lot of it. Um, and then also I grew up going back and forth between um, the U.S. and Turkey, which mm -hmm. required a lot of explaining on both sides and kind of a lot of translation, which is another mm -hmm. form of explaining. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the, the, what I learned the most about this from actually my thesis advisor at Harvard, who, whose name was Eva Badovska and is now at Fordham or somewhere, um, but she's like a dean of something. She, I Googled her the other day. She's like the <laughs> dean of education, so they, they recognize the good thing. Um, but she was like, because uh, I had kind of an attitude problem when I was writing um, in my academic writing before that, where I would just be like, I have too many ideas and they're, nobody else is going to be able to follow them. And that had been my experience was that I was thinking too many things. I'd read too many specific things that I was relying on. And mm. it's like, if you hadn't read them in that order, you weren't going to understand the thing. And I had just given up on anyone being able to understand that. And I would just sort of like, you know, dump it all out and put all the quotes and then be like here and it was like three times the length requirement and now you know once you're a teacher you like see that person and you're like oh my god like where do I even start with you but like <laughs> but but um I remember my advisor was like well and and, and I would turn it in and like I, I would never get like a horrible grade but I would never get like a fantastic you know people would be like well this seems interesting why don't you work more on your structure and I was like, okay, this person doesn't under another person doesn't understand me. That confirms my <laughs> idea about the world. And then, um, and then Eva was like, I can tell that you're saying something really interesting, and I'm interested in it, but I don't understand from the way that you described it. And like, I don't remember how exactly. But like, the metaphor that I took from it was like, that I was just driving around like a drunk driver. I was like, ah, there's all this stuff, and no one's possibly going to get it. And like. Um, and she was like, well, you know, you have to make the reader feel comfortable and say, you know, here, look on your left, you're going to notice this. And a little bit <laughs> further on your right, you will see something else that will remind you of what you just saw on your left. And that actually the reader wants to follow you and wants to understand and wants to have the good time that you seem like you're having and like you're just not letting them. Mm -hmm. And that idea of the reader who actually wants to understand was... I mean, that was actually a comment. There's a, there's a student in my class now who reminds me a lot of myself, and I don't mean that in a good way. <laughs> no, I do mean it in a good way. I mean it in all the ways. But I mean, the main comment I had for her was like, imagine that your reader is someone who loves you, like is someone who hmm. doesn't know you that well, but loves you. And that, that's not what we go into it thinking. We go into it. I mean, I went into it thinking like, my reader is someone who's like, oh, get out of your navel and stop being self-indulgent. Like, no, what, but why? Why is that person your reader? Why are you writing for them? <laughs> And uh, like, I don't know, reading is something that you do because you love books and you love reading and you want to be delighted and you want to understand. And my feeling with all of the, you know, whatever, Kierkegaard or like mm -hmm. tampons or like it, it, <laughs> I, whatever has to be explained, like it, it was really important to me. And uh, yeah, the person didn't live my exact life, but I think of it as a puzzle where I can find a way to explain that to someone else where that's going to be interesting to them too. And I, I think of that as the challenge always. And I think of that as a challenge for any writing project is how do you, how do you turn it into a journey that this person's going to be excited to come on with you? Hmm. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that you don't really want
want to see literature described, it seems, or, or at least one of the ways that Céline doesn't like to have literature described to her is through the historical, through history. Mm -hmm. She really hates history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she um, hates it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, there's a really great, hilarious um, parody of a, an academic lecture on um, the relation between Virginia Woolf and Henri Bergson, uh, the French philosopher of time. And it just totally falls apart because it turns out there's no empirical connection. They never historically, um, there's no evidence that Wolf actually read Bergson. And, and uh, in the book, it describes how just all of the She might have been to a the, lecture that he yeah. gave. And then, yeah, and then all the respects just get sucked out of the exactly, room. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, but this, this leads to Celine. She has a little kind of outburst. Um, she says, I felt outraged. So one writer hadn't read another writer. How is that proof that what they were saying wasn't related? Wasn't the theory of time more likely to be true if two people had come up with it independently? What kind of Cretans cared more about hammering out a <laughs> string of inheritance than about discovering universal truths? Historians, that's what, that was what's kind. They would only be happy when they had translated every miraculous book into a product of its historical moment. <laughs> um, so, do you, what, 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 what do you have against history? <laughs> oh yeah, no, I love history now. I mean, like everything else, uh, history can be done in a soul crushing yeah. way. And I think that like, that's all she's encountered at that point mm -hmm. is like people using it to shut down conversations and to like shut down inquiry. And I, I think history can actually do the opposite of that and, mm -hmm. and, and, and does. And mm -hmm. I, and Céline also believes more in like, you know, she thinks that there's, she thinks that there's some answer to things still. She thinks that there's a nature of time and it can be explained and that maybe Virginia Woolf and Bergson were both onto it. Whereas actually like in that scene at the end of it, like this Italian, genial Italian sounding man stands up and says, maybe it was in the air at the time, which is like the thing that people actually really do say at these academic things like patch stuff, oh, it was in the air. Um, but I mean, it's true, it was in the air. Like it, so, so now I, I, I do believe that you know, we're all the product of our, I mean, I, I, this is, it's both obvious and it's really important to me that the extent to which we're products of our time and of the ideas that are going around at our time and that that is, that's what there is. The books don't make sense without each other. There's no like one-to-one -one connection to anything else. Um, and it's something that's changing and that's being built over, over history. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's not how Céline sees it. And she sees it as something that's, another thing that's there to keep her from what's actually true. Yeah, and, and so she would rather, in a way, um, she would rather read in the, in the manner that Kierkegaard suggests, for instance, in the epigraph, which is, he says, and, it is, a pit, and is it a pit, not a pity and a shame that books are written which confuse people about life, make them bored with it before they begin, instead of teaching them how to live? Um, and so Lynn goes around looking for advice about how to live everywhere. And this is my final question for you is I wanted to ask about, um, so much has been said about your use of the, of the genre of the essay and the novel and the relation between these two forms and how you combine them. Um, but I was curious about the, the genre of the manual or the guidebook, um, which is something that you've written about a lot elsewhere also. You've written about uh, Kondo and you've written about Epictetus. Um, and um, there's, yeah, there's many places in this book where, where Celine reads uh, The Unofficial Guide to Life at Harvard, for instance, and, um, and she says that this book is actually more useful than anything she would find in Kierkegaard. Um, she says, this is on 277, um, she's, she's talking about Wholesome Fresh and the guides that, the guide has advice about this grocery store, Wholesome Fresh, and she says, how alone a person was normally walking down a street trying to choose between different businesses. It wasn't the most glamorous part of life or the one that was most often discussed, but it was so constant, like a heartbeat, like the waves. The question of where and how to spend the money that had been wrung from the world at such cost. Nobody really talked about it except the advertisements, but the advertisements weren't trying to tell the truth. The advertisements said simply that Wholesome Fresh was Wholesome Fresh. In some way, it seemed to me that the unofficial guide was the most truthful book, more so than either or, because it was describing the exact concrete situations you were in, specific to time and place, and was updated every year. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about the relation? Do you think that 
literature should be approached as a kind of guidebook? Or, and, and what do you see as the relation between the manual and some of these other literature? You wrote a whole wonderful book <laughs> about this. That's what I'm asking you about, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think I agree with what I think that you said, which is that we do read novels as, as self-help. Um, I guess I, you know, I wrote about this a little bit in my dissertation. Like I, I think of the novel, um, I mean, to go back to Don Quixote, I do think of it as being about kind of like a, a crisis in, um, that the novel in general is, a, is, is about some problem that has arisen in, in how to give advice and how to follow advice and also a problem in like um, exemplarity. Like, um, like before there was the life of Christ and everyone wants to imitate the life of Christ and that it seemed possible to do that in some, like it, it, it seemed possible. And then sort of like in Cervantes, it's suddenly like, wait, okay, so like, how am I gonna follow the life of Christ if I'm not, you know, a guy who's in Nazareth in like the year 20 or whatever, you know, living in this particular place? Like, am I, what do I eat? What do I do? And that's kind of the problem that, that Don Quixote is in. Like, how do I actually, like the, the, the chivalric tales were kind of exemplary. They were supposed to teach you different virtues. Mm -hmm. And Cervantes is kind of showing like, well, that sort of collapses when it comes up against the actual just texture of everyday life and that your body and all that, you know, it's kind of like where she's pushing the tampon and she's like, I, I'm doing something wrong. I'm following the instructions, but like the instructions don't know like the inside of your body, you know, like mm -hmm. it just, it, 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 yeah. Um, I guess uh, there's, you know, I wrote about this a bazillion years ago in my dissertation. Michel Jeanneré has something, if you said, where did he write this or in what context, I have no idea anymore, but that there are two modes of, of imitation and one was imitatio and one was mimesis and imitatio was um, imitating forms and it was more classic replicating um, the, you know, Cicero's whatever form of this to make your argument. And then mimesis was just representing what reality is. Mm -hmm. And there, and we have one word for it now, which is imitation, but they're actually like the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. And imitatio in some way is like, I don't know what you want advice to be, which is just like, <laughs> you know, do this thing. And then what you actually get is mimesis, which is like, okay, I'm going to go find a giant to destroy now and then the thing there is a windmill and you're like making this calculation you're like okay okay I'll just attack that and then you attack it and like a guy comes running out and you're like okay just going to talk to that guy now and it's all this like catching up operation mm. I feel like that space is really what the mm. novel occupies mm. I was thinking a lot about advice in terms of the novel and it's something that I'm thinking about with teaching now too I feel like you know both of these books are they're about someone who's doing things that I now view as misguided and that I would, in a lot of instances, really like to be able to talk to my younger self and, and, and give her advice, you know? And I remember from when I was that age, some of the things that I wanna say now are things that I remember hearing and being like, oh, that's garbage, I'm not gonna do that. And I was just thinking, and, and there was also an idea when I was younger that was, I mean, that's an, it's not when I was younger, there's an idea in the world which is that advice doesn't work and you have to discover, you have to make mistakes for yourself and that's the only way we learn anything. And I've just been thinking about the extent to which like, how much of advice was given to me in a way that I could take it and that I could, could accept it. And I think that's often when it was, I did take it. Mm -hmm. And often when I didn't take advice, it's either because it was presented to me as like, well, I know you're not gonna listen to this, but here's what it actually is. Or I know you think that this thing is the fun and exciting thing to do, but the thing that you actually should be doing is this stultifying, deadening thing that's actually better for you. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I just feel like, I've also been really conscious of how much of how much of pedagogy consists of frustrating people, how much of like professional life consists of hazing, how much of um, just how, how, you know, if you think about just things getting better over a like how hard it is to acknowledge that we, I guess I'll say I, like how hard it is for me as an individual to admit that maybe I had suffering in my past that was not totally necessary and that maybe it was caused to me by people who really loved me and, uh, and, and it could have been otherwise and they could have done something different, but they didn't. And like, 
and I can protect someone else from that. Like that's a really hard thing to think. And if you're not able to think it, then you think, well, you know, everyone did their best, which is true. Everyone did their best. Like everyone did do their best. But like, if you think like everyone did their best and therefore everything turned out for the best, that's not true. Everyone did their best. So some things did not turn out for the best. Some things you suffered were needless mm -hmm. and you could improve those things for someone down the line. Mm -hmm. But if you're not able to think that, then you're actually like, oh, you know, I, this frustration is good for you. This is how I was. I had a hard time with this and it ended up being good for me. Otherwise I wouldn't be who I am now. Yeah. And that's true too. Like you are a product of whatever you go through. Mm -hmm. but like pain builds character kind of like who like the idea that pain builds character yeah pain yeah. exactly yeah. exactly and then the other thing that I was thinking I was really into um I was really into Rene Girard for a while and yes. the so I was one thing that I was thinking about was the idea that every novel could have the title lost illusions because they're all conversion narratives mm. and they all are about some kind of like Christian reconciliation mm. and I was thinking I mean that analysis works on a lot of novels, but if that was true, theoretically you could just read one novel and you would be done. Mm. You know, if it was just like, oh, all the, you know, everything that I thought was cool turned out to be stupid. Like that is kind of crime and punishment. That is lost illusions. That is in search of lost time. It's, mm. you know, it's Madame Bovary. It's like I read in the black. It's like I had these ideals that I thought were so great and that the, the thing was dumb and you know, I'm gonna Don die. Coyote in a way. Don Quixote is exactly like that. Yeah, that's one of Girard's top. And, and then he dies. He dies. He sees he clearly. He's like, this was all garbage. Yeah. And then he dies. And then, ah. So disappointing. Yeah. No, but that Girard's like, that's a happy ending. But then, you know, I was like, the, so in what sense are novels participating in the idea that advice is impossible and that you actually have to, you just have to like do it all over again and suffer again in your own whatever, you know, cocktail life gave you? And I, I guess I was thinking about would it be possible to, for there to exist a kind of novel that, um, well, I guess what I was trying to do in this book to, to, you know, not to put it in general terms, but just in kind of small specific terms for this particular project. Um, I wanted Céline to be, to do the things that I actually did that I now think are wrong. Like some people are like, well, why doesn't she just become a lesbian? I'm like, because I didn't become a lesbian until I was 38. You know, like, <laughs> I, I don't want to like rig it, but like, uh, I don't want her to like um, see that, I don't want it to seem like she's set up for failure, but I also don't want it to be like at the end when you read it, you're like, oh, I'm going to do all the things that she, you know, because that's how I feel now a little bit about Anna Karenina. Like I read Anna Karenina and it's like, you can't blame Tolstoy. Like he was pretty clear. Like you're not supposed to be like this person. This is what ends up yeah. happening to this person. And yet when I read it, I was like, that's what I want to, that's what I want to be like. I want to be like her. I want to live this, like, um, her life is so romantic. She's thinking such incredible thoughts and I can just skip the end or like the end happened because it was then because divorce was illegal and now it would be different yeah. or like, I'm going to suffer like that. And then I'm going to write a book about it. And then, you know, later I was like, well, why was that even in the plan? Like what, you know, and <laughs> And I had this experience with some readers of The Idiot who um, I got some mail from, from reader mail about The Idiot that was like, um, oh, I had this experience that was, I was really surprised by how many people were like, I had a relationship exactly like this relationship okay. with Yvonne. Yeah. yeah. That I did not it know that that was com something. common. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Someone I talked to was actually like, I was Harvard class of 98 and I think it was the same person. And then, <laughs> then she was like, <laughs> then she had like done this like research and she was like, no, because I, yeah, whatever. It, it, it wasn't the same person, but. Um, yeah, and then people were like, uh, and I was feeling really bad about myself, and I was thinking I have to get out of this relationship. Yeah, if it's over, it's one thing. If it's like, oh, I was in a relationship like this when I was 18, and now I'm, you know, 40. Okay, great. But some people were like, like I heard from people who are that age now who are like, I'm in this horrible relationship, um, and I've been like questioning it, but now I know that I'm on the way to living an aesthetic life, and like, <laughs> and I was like. No, no, you know, Wait, like so that authorized them to stay in the the bad. Yeah, sort of or like now I know that even if it's not that clear of like I'm gonna stay in it, like yeah. no one said it that clearly, yeah. but like it was like I've been feeling really badly about this ongoing thing that I'm right. in, and now I feel good about it, mm. and like I, I was like I don't want to, that's not what I want to, the yeah. message that I want to put <laughs> in the world. Well, that I mean, what's so chilling is is when she reads the the diary of the seducer and she realizes like that she's been living out a kind of script or mm -hmm. that, that it could be a kind of more universal playbook that she's sort of been a pawn in. Um, but yeah, so, well, I'm glad for one that future 
readers such as my daughter will have this book oh. as a resource <laughs> and as advice. And thank you so much for this thank conversation. Thank you. It's been a delight. Um, Now is the time. Make yourself known. <laughs> um, yes, let's start with this. Oh, I think you might need a microphone. Where's it? Hi, um, I'm a freshman at Harvard, <laughs> crazy, and um, I'm considering majoring in English or Hist and Lit, <laughs> insane, um, and one of the advices, pieces of advice that I think the book does give is um, she sort of has this crisis of like, I'm a writer, I should be writing, no, I should be experiencing, and, and one of the things that I've it had happened to me this first semester is all my classes are reading and writing, and all my activities are publications, and so I feel like I spend all this time, you know, writing, creating, but like I have nothing, no material to derive from. And so I wonder what your advice is, short of going to Hungary or <laughs> entering into a problematic age gap relationship for like finding experiences outside of writing while still making time for writing, um, striking that balance. That's a wonderful question. Um, I think that there's sometimes, um, I read a lot. I mean, I, I think that um, sometimes I grew up with sort of a misleading idea that there's like literature and kind of like reading and writing is like this one thing that's like separate from everything else and then there's like actual life but like reading you're you're a person in the world with a body and a family and, and a community and that is already material and the more you read the more you learn different ways of describing that and 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 manipulating it and understanding it and questioning it and um, yeah, that's that's one piece, of, and I guess I you know I spent a lot of time thinking I, I just have to. One thing I was thinking about actually with your question too was like to what extent is like growing up in the Cold War part of all this and like new criticism mm -hmm. like and thinking mm -hmm. that um, history isn't. I'm just gonna like I'm just gonna go and and cre create my pure creation of the mm -hmm. intellect in some room like that's separate from all these things, but um, yeah no like like. The, the writing that you do can be in dialogue with what you're reading and experiencing. It's all part of one thing. That said, I, I do really recommend study abroad. I think that that's hugely, and, and, um, and just like, yeah, learning one other language or one other culture, or just having some other data point for like what to look at, I think that that can be really valuable. How about all the way back there? Hi, nice to meet you. Um, my name's Anita. I'm a junior at the college. Um, so I actually found out about the idiot because I was taking Natalia Georgievna's um, oh my God. class. Yeah, and she just retired. <laughs> oh. um, yeah, I, I was so honored to like be in her last like set of people. She taught like my boyfriend's dad. So it, she's just been like an icon. Oh my but gosh, I know yeah. you sometimes take a lot of inspiration from the people you've met. Um, and the people you've interacted with, but I guess how do you balance that with like not trying to like offend them or like feel like you're digging into their personal space or mm -hmm. that you don't want to represent them in a character like that they might find unflattering? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, how do you, I guess with like, I don't know, so the Natalia Georgievna is this like wonderful, wonderful teacher who was in the Slavic department for many years, and there's a teacher who's clearly based on her, who's a minor character in, in both of these books. I guess in that case, I was, I don't know, I, she was just such a uni, unanimously, unilaterally positive presence in my life that I wasn't really thinking about that there. But um, yeah, it, it how, how it's, it kind of goes back to like what were we talking about with the like feeling oh the vengeance thing mm -hmm. yeah yeah how do you like I do I I do think about that and there are definitely um, things that I've written that I have not published because I felt like it was too clear what and who it was about and that that person would be upset um, and it is. A, a calculation, like sort of a um, ethical calculation that goes into, it's, it's, it's definitely the worst part of 
writing autobiographically, like it would be wonderful if you could just write about yourself without um, bringing in other people. But unfortunately, that's not how, or fortunately, I don't know, but that's not how, how life is. Um, I guess the way that I try to think about it is um, to try to think about like expanding the ways I, you know, I think about a lot of writing as a project to overcome shame and mostly that's overcoming my own shame that's attached to, you know, I, I just think that it's all, I, I think a lot of um, education and a lot of upbringing is shame based. And there's this idea of like, oh, if we, if we didn't have shame, like you wouldn't want to live in a world without shame because people would be acting shamelessly. But like, you don't want the reason that people don't like, you know, like rape you in the street be because they would be ashamed if they were caught. You know, and it's like, it, it, it's kind of like negating the actual in, instincts of sociability that we have. There's, um, so, and I, I kind of think about it like there's an idea that, oh, if you write something about someone in, in sort of like an accurate or recognizable way, um, the way that it's almost like talked about in the media or like among, among writers, like, oh my God, did you read so-and-so's book? There's this person who's totally recognizable as this other person. And then everyone will talk about it and be like, you know, was it good or bad? And like, how, what does she think? And it's like, it becomes this whole kind of gossipy thing. And if you actually look at the thing that the person wrote, it's just like, it's just a, like part of their book and it's just a person acting a certain way. And like, if we didn't have this idea of like, writing being an act of violence that you do to another person, then it wouldn't seem as fraught as it does. And I think that that mode of violence, of, of writing feeling like an act of violence against another person is actually like codified into writing on a really basic, like it's, it's you know, I, I've been reading a lot of post-colonialism and decoloniality lately and it's, your writing is a way of controlling and it's a way of, um, your writing and the other person is is written about, but does it actually have to be that way? You know, like could it? I don't think it does. And I'm I'm I like to think, and this this could just be my wishful thinking, but I like to think that I'm writing towards it not being like that. And in such a world, you wouldn't really have to feel bad about mentioning other people unless you were you know lying about them or making them you know showing them at their worst moment or something like that. Um, which I wouldn't want to do anyway. So um, that's kind of how I think about it, but that it's a kind of thinking that is, uh, it's not very comfortable and it's, it's constantly evolving. Um, okay. Oh, sorry, Mary Ann, making me run. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Abby. Um, I'm a philosophy grad student um, and I guess one of the things that like I just really love about all of your books is that they don't feel in any way contrived like the events always feel like they flow naturally like in life and I guess I'm curious how you go about structuring them and um, what that process is like and also like how much of the work gets done in editing as well because it just mm -hmm. it feels so real and I don't I don't know how you do that it's like magical <laughs> oh thank you um well, I've only written two, <laughs> two novels, and uh, that part was di so. With the idiot, I wrote it, um, it. It's, it's inspired by my own experiences as a freshman in college, and I, I wrote it in my early twenties. I wrote the first draft, and um, and then I I wrote a very very long document, like much longer than that book, um, in a year that I took off from from grad school. And then it was just clearly not a novel, and um, I got demoralized and, and went back to school. Um, then I I reread it again when I was like thirty something, thirty seven, and looking at it then with like you know I'd been writing as a job for you know I I was able to see it as a piece of writing, and that made it easy. I, I could see that it was like inside it, there was a campus novel because it's like I, when I wrote it, I just thought I was writing like unmediated reality and it was, it was just sort of insufferable. It was like, there were a lot of flashbacks and flash forwards. And like, there was a lot of like 23 year old me being like, when we're young, we're so foolish. And then we get <laughs> older and we remember. And then I was like, what are you talking about? Like, nobody wants to hear that. And like, 
not even like, oh, now I'm actually smart and then I wasn't smart. It's like no one wants to hear a smart person explaining something. It's like you just want to be there in the moment with the person who actually doesn't know what's going on because that's where life is actually happening is before all of the ideas about this is like this and this is like this, before those have all jumped in there. Like that's the valuable part. And then I felt like I also could see it as like, oh, this is going to be sort of a campus novel. Like I'm going to start it and it's going to be mostly this year of school. I didn't think of it that way at first. And it was really giving it that calendar year and um, taking away everything except that person who was not knowing how stuff is going and who's in this kind of like disorienting and really painful relationship. That was what made it possible to write it as a book. So, so I guess the question is like, I, your question was like how, how to write in like an unmediated way that doesn't feel written. For me, it's like, I think that it's, it's very easy for me to produce large amounts of writing like that. It's just that nobody, including me, would want to read it afterwards. So it's more about giving it a form within that so that, um, so that you can have that experience, but in some sort of like, del, del, I don't know, delimited way that you can even process it. Because if it was just like life, like it, I, you don't need that. You have your own crazy head. Um, <laughs> and then with either or, it was, um, I actually wrote it, the, the original plan for either or was it was going to be this kind of like novel and then there was going to be an essay at the second half that was going to be about how novels ruin my life. And it was, um, and the whole novel I thought of as being kind of like setting up things that I was going to explain in the essay. Like here's where she thinks this thing about Kierkegaard because she hasn't read Simone de Beauvoir yet. And then that was going to come in and the, and then it was like, I was kind of like teeing up all this stuff so I could just like slam it in the second half. And then it, it. It wasn't, the first half wasn't good, and then the second half was really annoying to read because it was just someone like explaining something to you all the time. So I tried to like put the, the answer in the question, like, and I, I don't know the, the answer, you know? Like, it's, I, I hope that people will, will come up with better answers than I could by myself. Like, that's otherwise, why do you bother writing it as a book and giving it to other people? Um, so for me, for either or, it was like I decided it was going to be just that novel. And then it was like, well, what I had was sort of like, a fake out fake novel that was supposed to be just half of a book called Either Or, where it was like gonna be like, half of it is one thing and half of it is another opposite. Um, and then it's just like, how am I gonna make that into an actual novel? And what I found really helpful for that was actually screenwriting manuals, um, I, which was also super interesting just to think about. So like my friends who are into screenwriting were all talking about this book called Save the Cat. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> and it's based on the Joseph Campbell like Hero's Quest kind of thing, which is, it's also really interesting to think about to what extent is that like, does it even, work for women's story, like what, who is that for? But anyway, but it, but it does give you, like there's some kind of brain hacking, like cognitive something going on with that because he's like, you know, five pages into, a, it's a 100 page script, so it makes it really easy with the percentages, you know, five pages in, the person has to ask themselves this question and then like seven pages in, they have to have an answer that seems like it's, you know, and it's super specific things that, you know, at, at 25 pages in, something has to happen that seems like it's good, but actually it's bad, or it seems like it's bad, but it's actually good. And like, I actually, and there, there's a dark night of the soul, and a, so it's not like, you know, I don't think I could have ever sat down and been like, I'm gonna write something according to this plan, but once I had this whole list of just kind of like scenes that were like my riffing about different ideas and um, and, and my sort of thinking, it was, it was felt fun and productive to go into that and be like, okay, what's the dark night of the soul of this? Like, what's the worst part? Is it actually this part or is it that part? Is it when she has sex with a guy or is it when her mom gets cancer or like what? And uh, it, it made it really um, in, like kind of like a formal puzzle to think about. Um, and then I ended up, of course, writing new stuff for it to fit, but I actually found that really helpful. You pick that. Thanks. Another self-help. Oh, do I pick it? Yeah, you can pick one. Uh, okay, I'm looking at this person with hi. Hi. Um, so I'm also a first year at the college, and incidentally, um, the idiot was the first book the the first book that I read right before deciding to come here. So it was a very very full circle um, moment. Um, but you kind of talked about how uh, you wrote your first draft. Um, after being removed from college and kind of having that space to reflect on um, what your undergraduate education meant to you. Um, and so I guess I'm just kind of wondering, like, do you think that having that time away from the university allowed you to create a more accurate representation of the campus? Or like, is it possible to kind of have a truthful depiction of your own experience while you're still in it? Or do you kind of think that having that period to reflect and analyze and really sit with your own thoughts is necessary to kind of craft that truth? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I actually, 
You know, I, I wrote my dissertation on the problem of the time of writing, which is that it's, it's sort of like an illusion in the books that we have, uh, the books that we read, that like, like when was this huge book that I'm reading actually produced? And if you look in the books, you can find different like hints of like, like, I don't know, was it Great Expectations? Like at the end he becomes a lawyer and it's like, so when did you write this book that's written, it's in the first person, it's written as well as a book by Dickens, a full-time writer who's like, you know, put a lot of time into writing. Like, like when did you do that? And it, um, which is to say, I, so this is a question and, 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 and Chekhov, I remember somewhere was like, I can never write from life. I can, you know, I have to be able to remove. And I, I guess my sense is that of course you can write from the place and from the time where it happens and there must be things that you gain from that that um that you know everything everything is is has its advantages and its differences everything is like a portfolio of strengths and weaknesses and i'm sure there are things that you get from writing at the time that you don't and and a lot of idiot i did write at the time and it was you know i but the reason that i wrote it in that year was not so I would have distance to think about what my undergraduate education meant. It was so I would have time to write. So I went to grad school and I was thinking, I was thinking, oh, grad school will be sort of like less time than undergraduate, like, and I'll just write it in my spare time. And then that turned out, like, if you're actually like a people pleaser who's trying to do the right thing, that's not true. You cannot also do another thing while you're a grad student if you're trying to be um, compliant and do a good job. Uh, so, so I ended up taking time off and I was like, I'm gonna, um, I, I took a year and a half off and I, you know, sat down with the stuff that I'd written over that time. In the end, I, I do feel like um, the time that I came back to the idiot, like in my 30s was when I like looked at this draft that I'd written. It was when I was trying to write something about a situation that I was in at that time. I was trying to write something kind of autobiographical about like a New Yorker writer who was living in Istanbul and I was a New Yorker writer who was living in Istanbul and like I couldn't do it. It was too... You know, it was sort of like the other question. It was like, how do I write about the people while they're actually there? And I'm, I'm in the, I don't know how it's going to happen. And I don't, I, you know, I started having more and more flashbacks to try to like explain how things were. And then at some point I got to a flashback that was like, um, this is a flashback to this character's time in college. And by then I was like, I don't remember, you know? So then I was like, oh, I wrote a whole novel about this at some point. <laughs> like, so I, I, you know, I got it out of the cloud and I looked at it and then I was like, oh, I see how this is a book now. Like, I see how I could, like, I guess I, I could imagine, and, and it, it seems sort of enviable to me, to be at that point while something is actually happening. But for me, it was turning that into, turning the idiot into a book. It wasn't even just waiting for a couple of years after. It was, like, waiting long enough to see how the, outpouring of my feelings that I wrote was actually a text that could be structured and, um, and, you know, put into certain forms. And it took like a certain understanding of forms that I'd gotten from reading a lot and from, you know, working with editors and from probably from doing the, the, you know, interminable graduate degree and the theory of the novel. But yeah, but I, I, I realize that's not the answer I would have wanted to wanted to hear when I was a freshman. I'm sure that you'll do it much faster. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I see two friends there who <laughs> both raised their hands. OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's my question. She was just helping. <laughs> OK. Well, it worked. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, I have a question about your interview with Celine Siama for The New Yorker. Um, you wrote about how Siyama is often associated with this idea of the female gaze, um, which is like a, uh, I don't know how to describe it beautifully, but it's a response to the male gaze in certain ways. And she has styles of lesbian storytelling that in your interview, you write about how they inspire you. Um, and I'm wondering if after having met her and having conversations with her about her style of creating art in the world, your approach to your own storytelling has changed mm -hmm. moving forward as you imagine yourself as a novelist? Yeah, uh, it totally has. I, I saw Portrait of a Lady on Fire, Siyama's sort of breakout movie, um, in 2019 when I was still very much working on either or. And I actually, I saw it with my partner and like I liked it. I didn't understand that it was like a revelatory you know, like I didn't understand all of the new stuff that she was trying to do. Like my, 
my partner who, you know, identified as a, as a lesbian since she started having any kind of sexual identity is like, there's a certain, um, like a, a certain degree of like looking at these stories from the side and seeing the heteronormativity in it that I did not see when I was in it. Um, and then she explained it to me and then I saw it again and then I saw it a third time. And then I listened to Siyama's talk at BAFTA and she's actually phenomenally good at explaining her ideas. And I just, that was when I decided that I, I really wanted to write about her. And then it didn't, I didn't end up meeting her because COVID happened. So um, I didn't end up meeting her until later. And then I, I'm a slow writer, so it didn't come out until like the same time as this book. But it was, I was really thinking about, to me, the really exciting thing about, um, I mean, it's kind of what, what you were saying about Diary of a Seducer, like it's, um, Satan has this experience of reading this super gendered story, but like she doesn't even know that it's gendered, you know? And, and this is an experience that I had. Like, I remember people in my literature classes when I was in college being like, this is just a straight white man, or like, this is just a, and I was like, do these people not have like, imagine, like just use your imagination. Like, I didn't understand the whole conversation about representation. Like, I need to see someone like me in the book. I was like, just use your imagination and you are that person. Good, problem solved. Now go to the next thing. And like, I, I, all of my favorite books were by like white men because they were the ones who weren't writing about how much they suffered from oppression and how, you know, like how marginalized they felt. And I was like, I don't want to write about being marginalized. I want to write about being a person in the world. I want to write about some particular experience. And then I didn't realize how violent that was until, you know, it didn't start catching up to me until I was in my thirties. And then I started really, there's like a kind of sexual injustice that you don't really encounter until like everyone starts having children and you, you really see all this like dark shit happening and it, um, in, in heterosexual life. Um, and, and I was, I, I really started to have questions. And, um, and there's a way that Celine Siamo was like, when I first heard like, oh, she's a lesbian filmmaker who makes like radical different movies. I was like, how is that gonna be different? You know, it's a love story. So like, okay, there's a, instead of a, a man and a woman, there's two women. like. What's the difference? But it's completely different. She's like, the very norms of storytelling are actually like the whole, the basic idea that we have that like a good scene in a screenplay is a negotiation. It's an argument between characters. It's conflict. Everything's based on conflict. What's the conflict? What's the stakes? What does this person want? And I realize that's how, I mean, screenwriting is more like that, but all writing is kind of taught like that. Like, um, the way that we think of irony is based on people kind of like, just a buildup of people lying to each other. It's, and stuff doesn't actually have to be like that. And it isn't actually true to how um, women are with each other. Like it's actually, like the rules of social life are actually different and that those would create a different narrative and that you can, that, that what that proves isn't like, oh, we should all write like lesbians. It proves that what we think of as the norms of storytelling are the norms of this like particular kind of very gendered interaction. And what that means is that we're just at the beginning of the, potential of story, you know, it's like the thing of where I just felt like, you know, when people were like, oh, we actually only use like 35% of our brain or whatever. I felt like we've only read 35% of the stories and we're like at the big, and that's how Celine Siama talks about it too. She's not like, oh, I solved it and now I created the revolution. You're welcome guys. She's like, this, we're at the very beginning of what can be done. I just found that so exciting because I don't know, all my life, I feel like all everyone's lives, we're like hearing about how the possibilities are all exhausted and there's nothing new under the sun and all the plots have been made. And just to hear that there's like a different way for like a relationship between two people on a stage to like unfold and the points in the plot could be different. I just found that like mind bending. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm seeing people in the, uh, the person all the way in the back, just to mix it up. I think this has to be our last question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, um. So I guess partly related to you know what you were just talking about, um, I wanted to ask about your essay in the London Review of, Review of Books, Gets a Real Degree, um, you know, which you were kind of critical of like the MFA and its role in producing fiction. And I just wanted to know what's you know whether your thoughts on that have have changed. And it seemed like from your last answer, your thoughts have kind of changed a bit. But I wanted to hear a bit more about that. Oh yeah. Um get a real degree it's i think it was from like 2010 so it's it's been a minute and i actually wrote the first the first version of it was like in n plus one and it was like 2008 or something and it was i remember that the assignment for it was like um 
they were like, oh, if we're having like a forum on the American short story, like write something. I'm like, I never read American short story. Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they're like, we're going to send you the best American stories of 2003 and 2004. And I was like, OK. And then I got them in the mail, and I read them. And I was like, you know, here. <laughs> I, there were various things that I, I did not find um, super pleasurable about most of those stories. and I, and. I and I was in grad school, and I was thinking about, you know, schema making, you know, what what formal features do these have in common? So I did that on those stories, and I was like, here's the here's the thing, and then that that was sort of received as like a um, like a real throwing down of the gauntlet on, on short stories. And then the London Review of Books was like, um, and then oh, and then because because in grad school you have to you think about the formal features, and then you have to think about what was the social feature that caused that. So I was like, well, okay, what do I think is the social feature that caused these people to write in this weird way? And the only thing I could think of was that these people have all been to creative writing programs. And it resonated with my own experience. And um, like to some extent, like I, I went to a creative writing like summer camp that was near a, a, a writing conference, and like all of these kind of like, the big names of the time would sort of come there and give readings, and we were allowed to go to, they were like for adults, but we were allowed to go there and listen to them. And I was sort of like, you know, like all of these people who, who it seems like they're all just writing for each other. So it was just felt like a completely closed economy that like when you actually study literature, you're studying something completely different. And I was like, I don't know, man, I kind of like this stuff better than, um, so, so I, my skepticism at creative writing programs came from, from there. And I was also very annoyed by the um, don't be self-indulgent kind of rhetoric, which, um, yeah. And then a, a book came out that was like, everything great that happened in, the creative, in, in American fiction is because of the creative writing program. And the things that he was talking about as being great, like I didn't think were that great. Um, and that's what that piece is. Uh, since that time, there's now um, literally no writer I respect who does not teach in some form of a creative writing program. They've gotten much more, it's, it's much less like there's a special cast of creative writers who produce creative writing for creative writers to consume. Um, and, uh, and it's gotten, I think, less craft centric and more, um, more kind of I don't know, like I, I teach in one of those programs now and I, I think of it more as like tailored around the expression of the people who are in the class rather than like passing on some um, technique of like omitting adverbs. And I think that that's like quite widespread and mm. happy to say, but yeah. I, I don't know if we can do, do can we do more? I'm happy, I could sit here all night. <laughs> um, well, this oh. person seems very eager, okay. so very right. last one, very okay. last one. Uh, thank you so much um, for this. I don't want to take uh, your time a lot, but it seems you touch uh, students' life, Harvard College students, but uh, not only students' life, actually you touch uh, a Harvard professor life. I wouldn't call myself professor, but I'm teaching Turkish at Harvard. Oh. Technically, I'm professor. But uh, you are just a huge part of my teaching, especially for the elementary, for the mush tense, indefinite past tense. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a, there are two past tense. I, I can't lecture, actually. <laughs> so in Turkish, technically, we have two past tense, definite, indefinite. But indefinite one is very tricky. It's not easy to learn, for, uh, especially for the English speakers. In my first attempt, just I see the just blank pa it, b b the blank faces, just opposite of me, just a horrified face. What is that? But after using your your text as a part of the idiot in that novel, uh, just oh, okay, it's it's more reasonable now. Just I want to thank you for that. I oh mean, my God, yeah, that it's makes it's, me so it's very happy. great. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Edith. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, those who, who read the book already just uh, just uh, understood what I am talking about. But if you are not yet, you, either or you can take Turkish or just you can read it. <laughs> thank you very much. Oh, thank you. That's really. I think fun. that's a great note to end on. Thanks. <laughs>